Okay, good evening. We call the uh, September Board of Selectmen's meeting to order at 731, it looks like there. Um, I guess the first order of business will be uh, to notice the fire exits, emergency exits, which, which all of you entered. The first emergency exit is to our right side, which goes out to the back parking lot of the town hall, where I believe everybody has probably parked tonight. If in case that one is inaccessible, you could go straight down the back hall, which will lead you out towards the uh, Orange Center Road Firehouse, or you can go up the stairs right behind the wall that the clock hangs on, and that will put you out onto Orange Center Road. Those are the three means of emergency access out of this room, because I am not climbing out a window, even though it's uphill. With that said, please stand and pledge the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, and I think tonight we'll start on my right. The audience is left with Selectman Goldblatt to introduce themselves, please. Mitch Goldblatt, and I'd also like to introduce uh, members of PA 601, Public Administration Class from University of New Haven, that are here this evening, uh, joining us this evening for our meeting. Very good. Welcome. Ralph Oakenquist. Oh, a short one here. Ann Petty, Secretary. Vincent Moreno, Town Attorney. Good evening, Joe Blake. Anthony Nastry. Roy Cusacrio. Very good. What class is that, Mitch? That's a class that I'm teaching at University of New Haven. It's an introduction to public administration, graduate Very class. Very good. This must be one of your students. He's late. It is. Okay. <laughs> Detention. <laughs> well, welcome, all of you. Okay. Uh, at this point, we go to public participation. Public participation is limited to two minutes. It is for people of the community to speak on any topic that is not posted on the agenda. Is there anybody in the audience for any public participation? Okay. Is there anybody at the board that has anything to announce? If not, I have a few here. Uh, not too many. First, uh, most recently we've had um, relatively easy month, but we have had a few of our good members pass away, and one that just passed away this past week who uh, served as chairman of the Safety Commission was Bruce Newell, um, 88 years old, passed away uh, this week, and last week uh, Mr. Woody Hansen, I think who a lot of people around town knew, who was, I think, also 88, uh, passed away. So we extend our sympathies to those families, and uh, we thank them for their years of service to our community. With that, uh, Saturday, September 29th, from 9 to 3, is uh, the UI Family Science Day down at their living store down there by, uh, I think I, everybody calls it Dunkin' Donuts Plaza, <laughs> down there with, on the Post Road. I think we all know where that is. Uh, at the Community Center, Center, on September 30th, is the Shriners Car Show. That car show has gotten bigger and bigger originally it started out just with a little bit of the front um, uh, grassed area and last year they filled the front grassed area completely and they filled probably m more than half of the backfield what we call the lower field last year so this year uh, weather permitting it's September 30th uh, all day event the Shriners car show the Shriners do uh, a lot of good with the money they raise. Uh, most of their money, I believe, goes to the Children's Burn Hospital, and uh, that's a good event to support. Uh, flu clinics. October 24th and November 15th are appointments only. You can call our OVNA at 891-2154 or 891-2165. November 8th, from 1 to 3, is for walk-ins. That's all at our, at our OVNA offices. And, well, actually the appointment ones are usually at the community center. The walk-ins are at um, the OVNA office here in the Clark building on or right on the green on Orange Center Road. 
Uh, we opened Tile by a mile a week ago. Lovely new business. Nice young family, the Van Heist family, opened uh, here on the Post Road, and we welcome them to the town of Orange. Um, there was a home in Bridgeport that was done uh, the extreme home makeover, and um, town council Vincent Marino and his uh, law firm at Cohen and Wolf uh, donated man hours, people hours, uh, towards that project, and um, Lily and August donated the furniture for it, and our own Roy Cozacrio and Dave um, from Orange Fence and Supply donated all the fencing around that and it's going to air on September 30th. Uh, yes, sir? Apparently that's not accurate. That's what we were told. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, apparently it's, it's uh, mid or late October. We were told the 30th is a... Yeah, that's what they had told us. That's what they told us originally too. And we told a lot of people that. Okay. <laughs> Extreme Home Makeover is on Sunday nights, I believe on... Uh, Channel 8 around 8 o'clock, I think. So on Sunday nights, keep posted, and you might see uh, the Orange Fence crew out there. You might see Attorney Marino or several other people from the town of Orange that donated uh, uh, goods and hours uh, to that project. Um, well, I can wait. I did put on my uh, announcements the bulky trash update. We have an item in here on the bulky trash pickup. It is going to happen. Um, I will wait to update on that a little bit more when we get to that item on the agenda, however. With that being said, that's it for my public uh, section. And with that, we now need to move into a public hearing uh, for the approval of James Hassenmeyer as the new permittee of the Orange Ale House. Uh, so we need a motion, please, to uh, proceed with that. Ralph and uh, Roy. Motion and second. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Okay, we're in the public hearing for uh, James Hassemeyer. And I think I warned him of this uh, when there was some confusion when he was before us a couple months ago. Ann, you want to read that? Notice is hereby given to the applicant and persons interested in the affairs of the Town of Orange that a public hearing will be held at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday, September 19th, 2007 in the lower level meeting room of the Orange Town Hall, 617 Orange Center Road, Orange, Connecticut, 06477 on the application of James Hassenmeyer as new permittee of the Orange Ale House, 517 Boston Post Road, Orange, Connecticut, 06477. Under the Town of Orange Ordinance Concerning Public Dance Halls, Pool Rooms, Exhibition or Amusement Halls, and Restaurants in which Dancing is permit Permitted. The applicant has indicated an intention to conduct a pool room and or dance hall establishment. Copies of the Town Ordinance and of the applicant's applications are available for review in the First Selectman's Office in Town Hall. Dated uh, the 10th of September, 2007. Okay, hearing that, um, we approved this one, I think just about three months ago. And then there was um, a separation of partnership. And if you remember, there was a little confusion. There were two names at that point, and we did question it then. And uh, evidently, the partnership has been uh, severed. Uh, and uh, so now it's going just to the name of James Hassemeyer. Do any of you have any question on that? Hearing none, do we have a motion? Oh, we have to wait to go out of public on this. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment on this? Yeah? I don't think so. It's Mitchell's class. <laughs> okay, hearing none, can we have a, a motion to close this public hearing and uh, uh, we'll go back into regular meeting. Okay, so motion and uh, second, Nastry and Blake. Okay. Do we have a motion now to approve this? Selectman Cusacrio. Do we have a second? Selectman Goldblatt. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Unanimous. Very good, Jim. You're all set. Okay. Next time I tell you, remember. <laughs> okay, we have the minutes of the August 8th Selectman's meeting. Do we, yes, sir. You can wait for me to ask. Easy, you're knocking your candy and everything. Don't knock the water. Don't knock the water. 
Um, do you uh, do you want to add these things to the agenda at this point? When we get to new business. Okay. Okay. Did anybody find errors, omissions, corrections that they would like so noted in these minutes? If not, do we? I will entertain a motion to. Uh, I I move that they be approved as presented. Second. Okay. Nastri and Goldblatt, is there any more discussion on this? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Unanimous. Okay. Old business. Um, the first item was uh, the ASCAP. ASCAP was that music licensing fee that that company was looking for and uh, I'm going to turn this one over to Attorney Marino. He and I have talked on it but I will turn it over to him. Okay, thank you. Uh, when we uh, met last week I was asked to look into whether or not the town uh, was mandated to pay this $250 annual fee and the license fee is not mandatory, it's merely an offer for a service. Uh, essentially ASCAP provides the equivalent of copyright infringement insurance uh, the fees for a blanket license to use or perform all the music owned or copyrighted by ASCAP members. So it's not for everything, it's only for what's covered by ASCAP. Uh, the license does not cover music copyrighted by non-ASCAP members. Uh, and the license also excludes special events, which is defined as an event with a gross revenue in excess of $25,000. The license provides that ASCAP is entitled to 1% of that gross revenue if you should have a special event. ASCAP does not actually sue anyone for cop copyright infringement. Instead, it sends out investigators who track the music being played at events and then notifies the copyright holders of the possible infringement, and then the copyright holders takes the, uh, the lawsuit. Uh, we could not d discover any cases involving uh, any cases where a lawsuit was brought against a municipality, uh, and states are immune from suit by uh, the 11th Amendment. So uh, whether or not that immunity would extend to a municipality uh, is uh, unknown, but I, it sounds like it would be. But in any event, there is no uh, reported cases on point uh, where any municipality is a defendant. So uh, I don't believe the $250 is a necessary expense. Uh, it is only $250, so it's, it's insurance if you want it, but I don't think you have to do it. Like because of Creo. It seems to me like it's it, it sounds like it would be the two hundred and fifty dollars plus one percent of revenues on any big events that the town would have plus whatever other organizations that represent Before. those that aren't represented by ASCAP coming down the road. Uh, Correct. I, I agree with you that it's not, I don't believe it's something we should do. Selectman Goldblatt. Just, I don't know if uh, either Attorney Marino or you, Jim, had found out what other communities are doing with some regards have, to this. Some have paid, and a lot have um, let it go. Uh, this started out, they started over on the New York line, and they're kind of working their way across the state. And uh, New Milford, for one, was fighting it, and a couple others. And um, I think that I could send my town attorney to help a few other towns, and they'd be quite surprised that with a little due diligence, uh, the information is available that uh, they don't have to. The, the Orange Country Fair, since it just passed this past week, would be one of those events that is not covered under this, that is a town-backed event that would... Uh, uh, be required to pay uh, was it one percent of the gross so we'd pay somewhere between nine hundred and twelve hundred dollars depending on the average year uh, on the if it's on the gross number um, you know so you'd be paying about a thousand dollars for that event and for what we pay the entertainers to come if they're going to sing the songs let them pay the copyright for singing the songs you know I mean that's how I feel personally we're not stealing. We're not doing it. I'm not paying for elevator music or phone background music. You know. Jim, you're looking for us to take action. It sounds like 
from your direction, from Attorney Marino, what Roy has said, that no, it doesn't sound like we're in a favor of this. We want to take action against it or just take no action. What's your desire? I would take, I would take, I, I would take an action to, to down it, personally. If the Do you think that red, red flags it as opposed to us just not taking action? I, I have my attorney. Taking, taking no action kills it anyway. You're not doing anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have no intention of paying that. I mean, Mrs. Mangini certainly not getting a requisition form from me for that one. Right. In, in their own applic uh, in their own brochure, it says uh, that you know it's it's not a mandatory thing. So uh, for other municipalities to be doing it voluntarily, they're probably doing it out of an abundance of caution, saying it's a de minimis fee. Let's just do it and forget about it. But you know, it's two hundred fifty dollars that you otherwise really don't have to spend. And it might. Where are you going to take it from? You're going to take it from the events committee, which is always struggling. You're going to take it out of the selectmen's uh, first selectmen's account. You're going to take it out of uh, uh, legal. You know, where's it going to come? You know, that's. It's not an item that we budgeted for, and it's not an item that I ne feel that is necessary. Well, I could see where a municipality that has uh, large events generating uh, large sums of money. Uh, we'd want to protect themselves on it, uh, maybe have a, a, a playhouse, a work playhouse or something like that uh, that's run by the town. But uh, we've discussed this at last month's meeting. We were quite surprised we even had the literature on it. And uh, I, for one, would not favor even paying uh, $250 to, towards it. So I, I, I would vote in favor of uh, either taking no action which uh, or taking an action that defeats the, uh, the request. The Orange Players, I was told, if they buy a program you know to put on a show they pay a fee when they buy that program they're certainly not going to generate twenty five thousand dollars but they do pay a fee already when they buy a show in, in order to put it on so they're already <coughs> doing their own thing it's like monastery I don't see any reason to, that, to do this I would uh, prefer that we take no action if in the future uh, the conditions change and we decide that uh, we want to sign up for it uh, than we can, but on the basis of the information I have so far, I don't see any reason to take any action. Like Minokin quest. I would agree with uh, Tony and Attorney Marino that I think it's up to the individual performers, as you mentioned before, to pay any licensing fee. I don't think a, the town or any organization should have to pay that. I think that's up to the entertainers, whether or not they use ASCAP or someone else's music. Okay. So I, I, I would recommend we take no action. All right, so everybody has chimed in in a negative manner, so I presume there will be no motion coming forward, no action taken. That's how you want to leave it. That's fine with me. Knew I wasn't writing that check tonight. Okay, second item under old business is the report on the ad hoc committee on the appropriations from fund balance. Selectman Nastry and Blake, I believe, were this committee, yes? I show that. Selectman Nastry's doing that. I have to move. Okay, I'll move sideways or somewhere. I'll go in the audience. You're going to run that? Yeah. Okay. The question before this committee. Question before this committee was whether financial decisions approved by the Board of Finance involving appropriations from fund balance, uh, from the undesignated fund balance, should be made subject to the approval of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, if you recall, Vin Marino made a, an extensive presentation at this, on this in a former meeting, and the conclusion of that was to form this committee to, uh, to look into the matter further, and then this committee was charged with the uh, job of making a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, the committee members are there, two members from the Board of Selectmen, two members from the Board of Finance, and a, a man from the public, Ray O'Connor. Uh, the background information that was provided by Vin Marino, myself doing research in other towns, and uh, CCM showed that the Board of Finance is responsible for overall financial policy, administration, budget establishment, and of course, 
after the budget is established, the, the Board of Finance, and when it's approved in a referendum, the Board of Finance establishes the mill rate. When they establish the mill rate, they're charged further with the responsibility that if there are any financial risks, obligations, judgments that have to be covered by the town, the Board of fin Finance is charged with the responsibility to increase the mill rate uh, in order to cover those financial obligations. So the Board of Finance has broad responsibility in the financial management of the town. Furthermore, uh, where the Amity budget was rejected 17 times, the Board of Finance had the responsibility to fund Amity on a month-to-month -month basis. And we did that for, uh, for a year and a half while the budget was being rejected all those times. <clears throat> when the town budget was being rejected because it had the Amity budget, the Board of Finance was responsible for providing the funds. And if we didn't have the funding and we didn't have the budget approval, uh, we had to look to tax and anticipation notes. And fortunately, we didn't have to get go that far. We finally got the town budget approved with the understanding that the, uh, the Amity budget would be uh, subject to the approval of the voters from the three towns. So the Board of Finance has broad financial responsibilities. We looked at the information that we could gather on the boards of selectmen, the legislative body of the town with much broader management responsibility as covered in state statutes, town charter, and other handouts received from the town attorney, uh, Vincent Marino, and CCN. In all the literature that we looked at, we didn't find any anything regarding appropriations from the undesignated funding fund balance uh, or for that matter, that the Board of Selectmen could uh, uh, make the decisions of any other boards subject to the Board of Selectmen approval. Now, that may not be true, but we couldn't find any reference that, that indicated that. Now, under the current financial practices in the town, monies designated by the Board of Finance by inclusion in the mill rate for pending legal judgments, assessment appeals, capital expenditures, et cetera, flow into the undesignated fund balance. And I have some history that I'll show later that will show that. And, not, and expenditures from the undesignated fund balance have been included in the town budget, capital for example, as a transfer from the undesignated fund balance under revenue. Other transfer examples included the Turkey Hill oil spill, the Mirtha payments, tax appeals, et cetera. We met in January as a committee and we went through all the data. And at that time we said, gee, we need an input from the Board of Finance. So it was the uh, judgment of the committee that the two Board of Finance members on the committee would review the issue with the full Board of Finance. That discussion took place on uh, February 12th and as a result of the Board of Finance deliberations, uh, they voted unanimously to continue the current practice. We then met as a committee on September 6th. All members were in attendance. After we reviewed all the data, excerpts from the minutes of the Board of Finance special meeting he held on February 12th, and the annual budget Board of Finance report for the fiscal year ending 6-30-03, a motion was made as followed by, by the ad hoc committee. Mr. Raymond O'Connor moved for the continuation of the current practice wherein the Board of Finance provides for the needed reserves at their discretion and approves appropriations from those reserves. All motions for appropriations approved by the Board of Selectmen are made subject to the approval of the Board of Finance. Mr. Kevin Moffitt seconded the motion. The motion passed unanimously. Then I went on, at that last meeting, we reviewed excerpts from the town report uh, of the Board of Finance for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2003. And this is in the green town booklet that was distributed at that time. Um, we, at that time, I, we established several reserves to cover legal judgments and other uh, 
expenditures or obligations that we felt were necessary uh, in order to keep the town solvent. And this list was included in that report. And for example, on assessment appeals, we had a list of assessment appeals. And for the ones, the appeals on the books in fiscal year 02, we figured that the uh, cost of the town after they were, though the litigation was completed, would be 208,000. The actual spent during that year was 79,000 because not all the cases are finished in a, in a given year. Then the, uh, then the appeals, that were on the books in uh, fiscal year 03 were 168,000. That was added to to that was additive to that reserve. But the dollars spent in that year, maybe carrying over for a lot of them were finished from fiscal year 02, was 192,000. And then for the total at the end, uh, on fiscal year 04, another 99,000 was spent and 94 was added to the reserve. So the bottom line at the end of the three year period was we put in 471,000 and we took out, we paid 379, leaving a ban balance for continuing assessment appeals of 99,000. Now the reason why I went through this is to show that all of that money flowed into the undesignated fund balance because when the appeals had to be paid, the payments were made out of the undesignated fund balance. And uh, so we covered it, but we tracked it to make sure we knew what was truly undesignated and what was uh, encumbered in the assessment appeals. Now, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but legal judgments were the same way. We're done the, exactly the same way. We added dollars, and as the judgments were paid, we tracked it so we knew exactly what was in the undesignated fund balance that was encumbered and what was uh, removed from the undesignated fund balance. Capital reserve, we take out the debt service payments, which becomes part of the budget, but we added additional dollars for the 400000 that we spend annu annually on capital projects, so we tracked that. So, and then the insurance reserves, this is not in the undesignated fund balance, but it works the same way where we have the self-funding under the insurance program. We track it to see what is the reserve in that account and then what are we spending. And this year, fiscal year 04, it looked like we spent more than we took in and that reduced the reserve to 503. Why do we do that? You do it in order to make sure that you have sufficient funds to, to keep that program solvent. And then it's a red flag to tell you, watch the expenditures and make sure that, uh, that we're keeping up to date on that. Uh, the history of the undesignated fund balance is there. I draw your attention to fiscal year 2003. That that amount in the undesignated fund balance, and in the, it was, that's the number in the auditor's report, the 3920000 included the reserves that flowed into that account because the Board of Finance added that in order to cover those payments. The following year, it shows the same number uh, without the reserve. So the reason why I show that is that if you think that 3920000 was too much, money to put in your reserve, it's not a true number because it doesn't show what's in, what expenditures have to come out of that number. So the true number, the 9.77%, is really uh, more like 6.6%. 6, 6 so we do that and track it in order, the Board of Finance does, in order to make sure that they have that under control. Well, this is a, an iterative process, an ongoing process, and I think that uh, it's really at the charter of the Board of Finance to do this kind of thing. And this was done by myself when I was uh, chairman of the Board of Finance. So, in conclusion, it was the unanimous recommendation of the special, special ad hoc committee that the Board of Selectmen concur with the motion of the Board of Finance. Spending of the fund balance requires constant tracking and ongoing financial risk assessment considered to fall clearly under the purview of the Board of Finance. So I reviewed the history, and that is the conclusion. And uh, we present it to the Board of Finance, uh, to the Board of Selectmen for their uh, uh, consideration. And 
a little bit about history. Those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. <laughs> I have one other presentation, but that's, we'll do that later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. That was a very good presentation, Selectman Nastry. Open to questions. Uh, I know Selectman Goldblatt will be first. Thank you. Um, Selectman Nastry makes an interesting presentation, and one that is based on things that have happened in the past but it isn't the complete picture of what happened in the past. <clears throat> Unlike the recommendation that's come out of the ad hoc committee uh, that's before us this evening, the Board of Finance doesn't have the right to spend money. They have the right to appropriate. It's the Board of Selectmen that does. And the Board of Selectmen has done that in the past. The, the issues that have been pointed out there the Turkey Hill oil spill, the Mirtha Fund, um, the others that were pointed out, the tax appeals, all got approval of the Board of Selectmen. And then the Board of Finance appropriated the funds. And I think that the, the motion that has been brought before us this evening is one that is, you know, flip-flop from what it should be. And I think the, not only is that the way we used to do things, and still, I think, continue to do most of the appropriations, but it's also what state statute says about reserve funds. Not that the Board of Finance, you know, it says, it says uh, in your motion that the Board of Finance provides the needed reserves at their discretion and approves appropriations from those reserves. All motions for appropriations approved by the Board of Selectmen are made subject to the approval of the Board of Finance. It should be all approvals from the Board of, the Board of Finance have to go through the Board of Selectmen. And I think that is backed up by state statute, which gives us the authority for what we do. It says in Section 7-360 that upon recommendation and approval of the budget-making authority, that being the Board of Finance, the legislative body, that being the Board of Selectmen, by a majority vote may create a reserve fund for capital and non-recurring expenditures. So, and it, and it goes on to discuss how those reserve funds can be appropriated and how they can be spent. So, I, I don't know how you came to this conclusion and I can't support it because I think it's in direct contradiction with state statute. Well, this, the Board of Finance can make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen to set up a reserve fund. And if they so do, that becomes, that has to go before the Board of Selectmen. And the Board of Selectmen approves that reserve fund. Then the Board of Finance cannot spend that reserve without prior approval of the Board of Selectmen. Our, we, we don't do that. If you remember when you were first Selectman and I was Chairman of the Board of Finance, I asked for these to become official designated reserves. And we had meetings on that subject and it was decided to leave it this way. So our recommendation is based on following the, the procedure. This thing came up in 1995 and it wasn't resolved then. In our system, we allow those funds to go in. It's the Board of Finance's responsibility to put it in there. You can't raise the mill rate. The Board of Selectmen cannot raise the mill rate. Only the Board of Finance can raise the mill rate. So they're responsible for putting the money in there, and it flows into the undesignated fund balance. And if you want to set up an official reserve, and that's possible to do, you make a recommendation to the Board of Finance to do the analysis, and they come in and they recommend that the reserve be established, and then the Board of Selectmen approves it, and then they can't spend the money without Board of Selectmen approval. That's the way we understand I, it. I don't, I don't think there's much, in a lot of what you said, I don't think we have much, di much disagreement. The problem is the way this motion is set, which the, your committee was appropriations from fund balance, is giving all the power to appropriate from fund balance to the Board of Finance. And the Board of Finance doesn't have that power by state statute. The Board of Selectmen does. And so therefore, I, I don't think, number one, you know, we shouldn't support it. We do that all the time with capital. You take $400,000 out. The Board of Selectmen doesn't approve that. No, because that's part of the original budget process. 
You but got, it doesn't. It, that's it, different, Tony. You've got you've got an approved budget. You have an approved budget that has a line item for capital expenditures. That's fine. That's just well, like having a line item for the police we, department. We discussed this at our committee, right? And and after all of these considerations, it was the consensus of the committee to make this recommendation and make this motion. Now, our charter was to to do just that, to make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen. I think we fulfilled our charter, and that recommendation stands by this committee. Uh, uh, now, if you disagree with the committee, that certainly is your right. That's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, I, I have an opinion on this, too, but I, not being the town attorney, I'm going to let him go ahead of, of myself. I just, I just want to start, uh, Mitch, with an inquiry, because I recall when I gave a presentation back, I think it was a June a year ago, uh, when I had the easel behind me, and I was kind of flipping through the large pages. Uh, I was looking at some of the statutes around where you were citing to. I believe that section, I don't have the statutes in front of me, but I believe that that's, I know. And that's why I'll, I'll, ask you, I'll ask you some questions, and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of what you're talking about. But my recollection is that that section of the statutes is actually uh, 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 titled uh, Municipal Reserve Funds or something to that effect, Correct. right? Uh, and Correct. that defines what a Municipal Reserve Fund is. There's an actual definition of what a Municipal Reserve Fund is. And then it goes on to say, if you want to establish a Municipal Reserve Fund, this is the process by which you do it. There's an appropriating body, which is your legislative body. There's a recommendation of your uh, budgeting body, which is your Board of Finance. And then you go along the merry way uh, in accordance with that statutory procedure. But the, the problem that the town of Orange, not that it's a problem, but the issue that the town of Orange was facing is that the town did not have des designated reserve funds as defined by that statute. Uh, and that's where I understand what you're saying. And yet the actual, legisl the actual legislative body that appropriates for the town is actually the town meeting. We do it once a year. Uh, and thereafter, we then, uh, the legislative body is uh, the Board of Selectmen for all the purposes not otherwise de designated to the town meeting. Uh, so uh, what would ordinarily, I, w I believe, would happen is the Board of Finance would make recommendations through the budgetary process. The uh, legislative body, i.e. the town meeting, would appropriate based upon the budgetary recommendations at, in May or at our annual meeting. And then to the extent that there were uh, necessary expenditures beyond what was appropriated by the legislative body, i.e. the town meeting, uh, it would then have to go to the other appropriating body if you went above what was originally appropriated. But if there were monies being moved within the original appropriation, that that was not an additional appropriation. That was simply a transfer of a, of, a, of a fund from one line item to another line item. And that then would be within the discretion of the Board of Finance, because all they were simply doing is moving previously appropriated funds from one line item to another. But if, for example, what happened with Amity, where there needed to be an additional appropriation, there would have to be an action of the appropriating body, which either would be your town meeting or your, uh, or your Board of Selectmen. Uh, and, and I think part of the issue is w what first happened, what started this discussion, was there was uh, a, uh, a settlement of a debt early, which by, by moving 500, I it was $525,000 from one line item to, to, to retire some debt. And the question was, did the Board of Finance have the authority to do that uh, because they were taking it out of a reserve fund? Well, they weren't taking out of a reserve fund as defined by the statutes that you're reading. They were taking out of an undesignated fund balance, which, and this is what I believe what I said then, and I'll say again, uh, the problem with undesignated fund balances is that they're technically not legally created. There's no statutory authority to establish our undesignated fund balance. The only statutory f authority that you find for a reserve fund is what you're referring to. And uh, it actually sets limits on what you could actually, the amounts that you could actually establish. The requirement for the undesignated fund balance is really an establishment of Moody's and what they want from a bond rating. And it's just something that has happened over time. It's evolved, and every municipality does it. Doesn't mean that it's right. Doesn't mean that it's it's uh, it's it's a creature of statute. It's not. It's just there. And. Uh, 
so I don't think we can we can mix that statute with what is doing it. I think, and Tony, correct me, but if I'm wrong, but I think your the the point is that it's not that the Board of Finance has become the appropriating body. It's that if the board if there are, are transfers to be made, as in the retirement of that debt, which started this discussion, uh, that that is within the discretion of the Board of Finance because they're not appropriating additional monies. What they're si simply doing is they're controlling the finances of the town to settle an outstanding debt to save the town money. Uh, but if they wanted to settle that debt by taking money <laughs> above what was originally appropriated, then I believe they would have to come back to your legislative body for that additional appropriation. I think the, uh, the point I was making is that as far as the debt was concerned, the Board of Finance made a, a financial analysis that showed what we were paying in interest on that debt and what we were getting in interest on the monies in the undesignated fund balance and based on that economic analysis they said if we could save money by retiring the debt early with money that we're investing at lesser interest so from a financial analysis standpoint it made sense for them to do that it may have made sense and there may be some disagreement there it may have made sense. I'm not sure it was actually appropriate when it was said to be appropriate. But here's the problem, is that the Board of Finance took money from an undesignated fund and designated it. That's like, that's like saying that, you know, the chief is here today and he wants, to give a, he wants us to appropriate monies for a police vehicle, which I believe are in the budget. But he could come to the Board of Finance next month and say, I want a whole new fleet of cars. I need a whole new fleet of cars, and it's going to cost us how many? $500,000, whatever it's going to be, okay? And by this interpretation, the Board of Finance can make that appropriation without coming to the Board of Selectmen. No, because Why? the reserves, because we said that the Board of Finance would establish money that they put in over and above the budget into that undesignated fund balance for assessment appeals. That money was put in. It was put in to be taken out. You could have set up a reserve for assessment appeals, but we didn't do that. You you didn't want a reserve for assessment appeals, Mitchell. You're right. I didn't. And, and you didn't want a reserve for legal judgments. We had to pay the bill. We had to pay $2 million for Merthyr, half a million dollars for Hibson. Well, how do you think we got the money? And we all knew that, Tony, because we, we did it strategically. The Board of Finance, the Board of Selectmen didn't appropriate the money. Well, Tony, the Board of Finance. You know as first selectmen that I had a lot of input on that when, when it was done. We agreed that's how it was going to be Listen, done. We worked at a team, but the bottom line was was the Board of Finance did the analysis and increased the mill rate to cover those legal judgments. I'm not disagreeing with that, but what happened... So it isn't somebody that came along and wanted to buy a truck and, and they suddenly went to the Board of Finance. But that money that was, that put there, was put there on purpose for those legal judgments. So they were, And besides, you had no choice to pay the legal the judgment. Money was the Board not of Selectment didn't have a choice and neither did the Board of Finance. But the money was not put there to move money at the end of one fiscal year to play, to play a gimmick on the taxpayers to move money from one fiscal yeah, year to, to save money by it doesn't matter if you're saving money or not saving money it was it manipulated well, the money rate then you have a, you have a totally different concept of what a board of finance does they save money they make decisions financial decisions the decisions the no the, that's, the, that's the problem the board of finance just appropriates the money that has been approved by the taxpayers the movement of money the movement of money from one fiscal year to another was not approved by the taxpayers, was not approved by the board. It wasn't was in the budget. That's right. And therefore, you didn't have the authority. They were you. establishing the, the budget. The Board of Finance did not have the authority to do that. And that's the whole point of why this all got started. We have moved money to the Turkey Hill oil spill. That was approved by the Board of Selectmen. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. It absolutely wasn't. Oh, come on, Tony. It of was never. It was. it was. it was transferred by the Board of Finance. After approval of it the was bill never by the Board of Selectmen. No, you never approved those bills. Go back and check the minutes, you, Tony. You of course we did. Of course we did. Okay, we did. Tell. Hey, look, I, all class I, 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 say, I say it again. We looked at all these things, and you asked for a recommendation of this ad, ad hoc committee. We've given it, Mitchell. Now, if you I'm disagree, not, you're free to disagree. And I'm free, I am disagreeing. I will not support this. I believe it stands in the way of state statute. I believe it's a very dangerous precedent for us to take. And for this board to give up its authority it is ludicrous. You never had it. We always had it. The Board of Finance took it away. And now, you're, and now you are legitimizing it. Okay.
Okay. Um, I have a just a couple thoughts here on this one, and then we'll move it. Um, there are times when I've seen sitting there and sitting here where we've made <coughs> motions to buy things and spend money. And there are times when I've been sitting there and here when we've made recommendations to the Board of Finance that we want to proceed with something, wherein they had to find the funding to do that. And I've been one who's questioned at times, you know, where is the money coming from for this? And well, the Board of Finance will have to find the money. So I've seen it in both directions here, but it's always been in the eight years now that I've been here that uh, uh, the Board of Finance does finally, you know, find the money and it goes through their committee uh, for the final approval. We send them recommendations, um, but they do, or have, I should say, in the past, found the money to do these uh, things. We don't actually... Uh, we approve purchases of uh, budget, already budgeted things, uh, one being the chief coming before us with a car bid tonight. Uh, that already went through the public process, but sometimes during the year there are items that come up, whether it was Mirth or the oil tank at Turkey Hill or uh, maybe some things on the agenda here tonight even that... Uh, weren't necessarily budgeted and we send a recommendation to the Board of Finance and um, they then hash it out and uh, uh, come up with a conclusion. Also, I'm not sure, I do remember the attorney's presentation there that night with the sheets that were big as life. Um, uh, and I'm not sure, Mitch, if your statute there, and I don't have it in front of me, properly applies to reserve fund versus undesignated fund balance. Um, I had this go around with Tony, and then <coughs> Tony told me I was wrong too, Mitch, so don't feel bad. Um, in regards to questioning him on reserve fund versus our undesignated fund balance, and uh, for those of you out there who don't know what the undesignated fund balance is, has Mitchell prepped you in class on the undesignated fund balance? I've only had one and a half classes so far. Oh, my God. <laughs> the undesignated fund balance is the money that accumulates uh, through fees and revenue other that the town has taken in, uh, and sometimes a full budget isn't expended in that year, and after the report is all audited, the budget is audited, there is sometimes money's left over. It's a bank account, basically of excess funds that have accumulated. And um, it's recommended, there's varying uh, recommendations, but it kind of is tied to your bond rating. Uh, you heard the attorney talk about Moody's before. Uh, and there's been varying discussions on this. When I first got involved, it was five to 7%, but as of your operating budget. Um, I've heard over different time, and now that the economy has had some uh, changes and shifts in it, you'll hear, uh, recommendations anywhere from uh, 8 to 12 percent or 10 to 15 percent of your operating budget. The Town of Orange budget is currently 52 million dollars. Um, so we, you know, are required to keep quite a reserve on that, which is where we're going. Uh, that money sits there, but it's allowed to be used. The, a certain percentage of that money above and beyond the requirements of the bonding uh, company's recommendations is allowed to be used, and that's what all this is hinging on who has that final authority and when we do send recommendations to the Board of Finance uh, Chairman uh, Selectman Nastri, Chairman of this committee believes that the Board of Finance has the final decision on appropriating and Selectman Goldblatt believes that the Board of Selectmen has the ultimate authority on appropriating those funds. My question is in the statute that he's reading is listing it as a reserve fund account. I'm not sure if this is listed as a reserve fund account or just as our fund balance, which is separate, separate. and you heard the attorney say that it is not listed specifically by selectman motion as a reserve account. So that's why we're in this quandary where they are jousting here a little bit. 
I just, have a couple questions. I just have a couple questions because I, 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 Mitch, I agree with you that the Board of Selectmen is the appropriating legislative body for purposes other than what has been left to the town meeting. So I don't think there can be any dispute amongst anyone that this is the appropriating body. But uh, 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 Selectman Nash, if I can just, since you were the Board of Finance Chairman, you'd probably be the best s suited to answer. When the Board of Finance presents its annual budget, does it make a recommendation for what percent the undesignated fund balance should be at? Absolutely not. It does not? It does not. Okay. Uh, is so in fact, if you read the statutes, the Board of Finance, after the uh, mill rate is calculated to cover the budget, the Board of Finance has latitude to add 4% of the budget. So if you have a $50 million budget, we could add uh, $2 million to that to establish a prop proper reserve. So it's the Board of Finance that has that authority. And why, does, why do you want a proper reserve? Well, if, it's, if your rate to borrow money is uh, impacted by, by Moody's rating, then the Board of Finance is responsible to keep that rating high. Right. When, when you have a, uh, a fund balance, an undesignated fund balance, that is 5%, even if the Board of Selectmen appropriates money for, for that, and it will bring that below, the Board of Finance does not have to, have to approve that. I understand. I get the you know? So <laughs> the fact that the, you say the Board of Selectmen has the appropriating power, the Board if, you can't spend money that isn't approved by the Board of Finance. Well, they're elected people too. Well, no, I, I think, and I, I think it's just, we're, I think we're on the same page. We're just, just about there, uh, because I, gr I think what the issue is, it's the appropriation appropriating body is the the Board of Selectmen, subject to approval of the Board of Finance, because they control the purse strings. And if I recall correctly from that conversation, uh, Selectman Blake, in his vast number of years with the uh, board had said in all his years that was pretty much how he recalled the process working but my, my my thought process is if the voters at the time that they vote to approve the budget are aware of the amount of the undesignated fund balance and vote accordingly to approve a budget with a certain reserve in the fund balance then the, the fund balance can be tantamount to a line item which the voters are knowingly voting on uh, because if they feel the fund balance is too high, they could vote down the budget. Uh, but if they vote up the budget with knowing what that fund balance is, then I think clearly it would be within the discretion of the Board of Finance to laterally move from one line, li one line item to another, which would be clearly they could take out money from the fund balance within their discretion to cover operating or any other expenses in a fiscal year. Yeah, the, the preferred method of operating when I was chairman was to... Uh, completely divulge what we were putting in that undesignated fund balance. And in your presentation... Now, you could have gone another way. We could have gone ahead and said, okay, we have a uh, judgment of so many millions of dollars, we'll put it in the town budget because the town has to pay it. So instead of having a 5% increase, you'll have a 12% increase that year. And, uh, you know, you could go in that direction if you want to, the Board of Finance could include it in the budget. Uh, in this, in this, the way we've been operating in this town is that money flowed into the undesignated fund balance, and the Board of Finance had the authority to put it there by statute. So now, now you're quibbling about words, saying, "Well, once it's there, who can take it out?" Well, gee, if you, if we had to put it there to cover a judgment, well, uh, right. yeah. and, and since since it was, since but, it was but, but it was put there for a pending judgment. And when the judgment came down, it was the Board of Selectmen that approved the expenditure of the funds. The money was put in there when the Murtha judgment wasn't known to be finalized. And we didn't want the world to know how much we were appropriating because it could have jeopardized our position in court. Okay, but when the amount was the, the Hibson situation, when that was determined, we put it in the budget. It's been in the budget ever since as a line item to spend. Right. So I, I don't see, and, and the statement was made that the Board of Selectmen appropriates and the Board of Finance approves. I don't think that's necessarily true either. Let's say we, appro we appropriate or approve a, a legal judgment. The Board of Finance can't say we're not approving it and not pay it. They don't have the authority to do that. You have no authority, you have no authority to turn it down. 
Uh, uh, we cannot so turn it to legal uh, judgment uh, down because you'd go to jail. No. <laughs> But, but maybe, it's not, maybe it's not a legal judgment, Tony. Whatever, whatever the issue is, you don't have the, you don't have the authority to approve. Okay, I, I, like, I, I, I stand with my recommendation. Uh, I, I understand that. Uh, if I got to make a request of Mr. Davis here, if this is going to continue this way, I would like those things like on Jeopardy that you hold in your hand and you hit the button because these two need them. Quick question. Okay. Selectman Blake, quick, he was on this committee also. Quick question, Anthony. And many years of service. Many, many, many years of service. Okay. Okay. A sentence was added because yeah, of okay. Joe. Okay, okay Joe. The, uh, a quick question. You made a statement. Uh, I'm not sure whether it, whether I misunderstood another statement made before that is the increase of 4%. Was it 4% or 4 mils? 4 Four percent. Four percent. Okay. Another question for the attorney. Uh, with this, before we do the gong show here, uh, <laughs> is it possible, or some down the road legally, to uh, give the board of selectmen authority to uh, appropriate a certain amount of monies without the approval of the board of selectmen? In other words, down the road, could you say, future board of selectmen? Uh, have the authority to uh, uh, to uh, spend, if that's a good word for it, uh, appropriate uh, up to let's say uh, uh, let's say twenty thousand dollars without prior approval of uh, of the board of selectmen or a lower amount or another. Is that is that a legal? So to, to In other words, I, it, uh, it sounds like um, it sounds like Mitchell is. Uh, hoping that the Board of Selectmen could make some appropriations here necessarily without the Board of Finance approval. Is it legally possible under state law to set a figure that the Board of Selectmen can spend out without approval of the Board of Selectmen? Is, is that an ordinance that could, could, could happen? All we do is we send the recommendation to the Board of Finance to be uh, discussed and figured out. Right. Um, I, I think that's been that's the way it has been. It seems to be we're we're, uh, we're uh, jockeying back and forth at one side of the table to another. Uh, that's obvious. Uh, but what I'm saying is, it possible Ralph, that move. we can spend uh, an ordinance to spend a certain amount of money without prior approval of of the board of finance. Well, and I think if I understand the dispute, uh, is uh, Mitch's position being. It is the Board of Select, in the first instance, the town meeting, and the second instance, the Board of Selectmen, which is your appropriating body, because they are the legislative body. And it's the appropriating body that, are, that approves the uh, spending of money. The Board of Finance simply administers the spending of the money and has to fund it based upon the appropriation. And uh, presumably, if the money is not there, the administrator comes back and says, there's an insufficient amount of money, you have to... Uh, and if you want to uh, cover this expense, you're going to have to go back to the taxpayers and raise money, uh, raise taxes. Uh, the the uh, ad hoc committee's position is, well, that's not correct. The Board of Selectmen is the appropriating body, but it's subject to approval by the Board of Finance because what's vested in the Board of Finance is the authority to administer the money. And, of course, that's an oversight. And essentially, the Board of Finance serves as a checks and balance on the Board of Selectmen. Uh, so to say, hey, look, we're not going to approve that because it's not within our budget. We don't have the money. We're not going to dip into the undesignated fund balance. I think if I understand, that's pretty much that where, from Mitch's standpoint, if the Board of Selectmen said, fund this million dollar whatever, the Board of Finance has to fund it. Right. You know, this thing was talked about in 1995, yeah. and no conclusion was reached. Because if family. you're going to, if you're going to try to make a change, you know, uh, our committee said there should be a joint meeting of the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance and do the necessary research. After we looked at all of the issues involved and particularly putting millions of dollars in that undesignated fund balance legitimately and telling the voters at the time, you know, n we, we catch hell when we raise the mill rate. People have to pay taxes. And the Board of Finance does not raise the mill rate unnecessarily. If we didn't have to raise the mill rate, we wouldn't have raised the mill rate. And uh, it was only because there was insufficient fund balance that we had to raise the mill rate. So to say that uh, when you take the heat for increasing people's taxes, you don't do it loosely. You only put in that undesignated fund balance 
things that are, are actually necessary. Tax appeals are, are, uh, are litigation. And when the, when the town settles on litigation, that money has to be paid. You have to refund that to the taxpayers. The Board of Finance puts the money in there. Now, they have the option of exercising the statute that Mitch is talking about by setting up a reserve. And if they do that, then the Board of Selectmen has to vote on the withdrawal from that reserve. But we don't run our business that way. You know, and all of the prior discussions opted for continuing the current practice. And that's where we stand as a town. But Tony, the current practice was all tax appeals had to be approved by the Board of Selectmen. The Murtha situation, any legal judgments had to be approved by the Board of Selectmen. That's legal. Well, but there's no, very comfortable. About. You were very comfortable in the making those approvals because you know we put the money in the undesignated fund. Of course. But what you're doing here is giving the Board of Finance a carte blanche to spend the undesignated fund balance, which they, they don't, don't have. They don't have a carte blanche. They're not going to give money they back to people have. that isn't that that they shouldn't get. But that's ridiculous. They don't have the authority. In the, uh, in, in, they and manage, what I'm, say, they what I'm saying it. is... They manage it, Mitch. They manage it. They don't manage it. They do manage no. it. No. They're, they're a check to manage the, the line items that have been approved. So you manage to make sure the police don't overexpend and public works don't overexpend. That's what you manage. The decision making to you use know, undesignated they, funds to designate them somewhere else the is finance, not in the purview of the Board of Finance. The Board of Finance establishes the budget. That's right. But and it's the people that approve it. <laughs> There's no disagreement there. The, the, and the, and the additional power of the Board of Finance is to put more money in there because they know the town is going to need it. And you're saying that a, a, a board that has that power to do that and raise people's taxes in order to do it, that they don't have any power of, of, of expenditure? They don't have the, the board of selectmen who... They don't have the authority by statute or otherwise. The problem is you're arguing me over, I think, semantics where the reserve fund is undesignated fund balance. What you haven't shown me is anything in the state statute that says that the board of finance has that appropriation authority. They don't. But the, but, the, but the problem is the statute upon which you're relying is, is not applicable, and that's we can't start in a place that we don't belong. Uh, I think uh, we're splitting so hairs. I would like to think that it does, it would, or it would apply, but you're not showing me so anywhere else in the statute that I, says I, the Board of Finance has the authority. I am they going, don't. I am going. It doesn't say that the Board of Selectmen has the authority. Wait a minute. I'm in the front chair here. <laughs> this, for the moment, yes. I think that I am going to request that this get tabled until next month. I want that big board back <laughs> with those papers the size of bed sheets that had all the information on it. Does that still exist? We'll we'll get it. Um, and I want I think that I think that until the um, documents are in front of us again as they were, what was that six months ago? Um, uh, I don't think that you're going to come to resolve here. Mitch is going to have his view, Anthony's going to have his view, it may stay that way even after those documents are reviewed, but I want the documents here before we go any further with this, I'd like a motion to table that until the October meeting. That is my directive to you, sir. You got it. Very good. Thank you. Six. I'll answer your question. Okay. <laughs> we need two items added, please, to uh, new, bu new business. Uh, Make them items number, uh, well, there's nobody here for either item, so. Uh, yes, there is. Oh, there is. Ken, uh, so Kenny's just sitting there and be like, what am I? <laughs> Sorry, sir. Um, why don't we make them, uh, we can put the, make them, um, no, we can really make them items number, make them in the new six and seven and move six through 11 down one that way, because those are all items that Vincent or I have to talk to from six down. Uh, I need an, a motion to add to this uh, resolution to participate in the fiscal year 2008 emergency management performance grant um, first. And I also need uh, a motion to add to the agenda the uh, bulky trash pickup beds. We can have those one at a time, please, or. Uh, Thank you. And the second one? Uh, second to that one? Okay. Any discussion on that? Hearing none. All those in favor, aye. The aye. second one, bulky trash bids. Selectman Cusacrio. Second. Selectman Goldblatt. Any discussion? Hearing none. Thank you. Those will become items number six and seven, and the current 
items 6 through 11 will all move one number. All right, first item on this agenda, this poor lady has been sitting there waiting through all of this painfully. Um, Orange Volunteer Fire Department requests to hang a banner. Stephanie Knight is with us from the fire department. You uh, see their letter in front of us. Uh, it has to do with October, which I think since all of us have grown up in the town of Orange, we have all always known that October is Fire Prevention Month. Um, the fire department is looking for this banner to be an informational type of banner. They have gone to, has this re banner been ordered and all, Stephanie, already? No, it has not been ordered. Until we get approval? Okay. Um, do you want to tell us, if you want to, you have to come up here, a little bit about this. Um, what you what you're going to have on this banner? I mean, I don't mean exactly, but um, it's per it's purpose. purpose. Yes. Okay. Um, the basic purpose of the banner is so that we can um, go to the town residents, remind them that we are a volunteer fire department, and let them know that we are currently seeking active membership from the town residents to join the fire department. Okay. And it's Fire Prevention Month. It is also Fire Prevention Month, which is why we chose the month of October. However, we are flexible. Okay, questions? Selectman just, just a quickie here. Um, the, we have already approved for the train railroad uh, show, I think, which is October 7th, the banner. I so had this would, into this today. This so would be after that? I believe so. Did you? It's October 7th. So, so they'll take theirs down probably how up? The eighth, ninth, and then this one, something like that. Go up and then this would go up after the train show one. Is that, that right? That's fine. Okay. I'll so make, okay. make a motion to approve based on that. All right. Do we have a second on that? Okay. Selectman Goldsblatt and Cousin Creo. Um, I have a little discussion on it. Just a recommendation. Any other discussion from the group? Okay. Just make sure that you have to have it made, and then you deliver it to uh, Public Works down at Lambert Road to Don Foyer. Yes. And they take care of putting it up. And uh, Sinorama, I think he makes probably 99% of the banners that go up across there now. So he's pretty right. We did uh, check known. with we did check with the Public Works Department, and they did recommend Sinorama. Okay. Okay. Hearing no more discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. You're all set. Thank you. Okay. Um, item number two is the Bryan House Foundation repair. Um, Jenny Reinhardt Historical Society is here and Marlene Silverstein Historical Society is here. There's a little bit of paperwork in front of us. They um, only had one bidder for this job. I know in the past that's been a problem, but it goes back to that discussion we've had uh, um, of that other municipalities are also having with getting minimal bidders on uh, a lot of these projects. Ladies. Yes, I'm Ginny Reinhardt, President of the Orange Historical Society, and we're here to ask you to approve that one bid for the restoration of a bulge in the foundation. And the bidder is the current restoration contractor, Wes Korjic, of Historic Preservation. So the Orange Historical Society Board has approved the amount, which is state-funded DECD funding, and we'd like you to approve it. Okay, there is one bid for that. I yes. Um, discussion for, and you didn't introduce your helper. Marlene Silverstein, treasurer. Discussion on this. I have a request. If this gets approved tonight. I'm going to make a deal with you here. <laughs> if they approve, if they approve this tonight, I have asked in the past, and now I'm going to make it contingent. They clean up all their restoration material on the right side of the driveway going up because Mr. Uh, well, the neighbor has repeatedly requested uh, that that be cleaned up, and the green barrels are still sitting there upside down and all, and I would like to work with the neighbor and get that sure. stuff. We can put it up by the barn or mm -hmm. back or somewhere. There. We agree. So. We okay. absolutely do agree. All right. Um, this is the man, just so you know, who's currently has the congregational church all taken apart over here. If any of you have paid attention there, they have some serious uh, uh, 
construction needs over there also. Mitchell. Yeah, um, you know, usually I'm not too in favor of going forward with only one bid. Um, however, in this case, this was, this is the person who is currently been working, uh, has been working on this for a number of years now, who I believe the Historic Society is very happy with. As you mentioned, he's working on a building right across the street here, one of the few that will work on buildings of that age. Um, so the Historical uh, Society seems confident that, um, that in his work and that the, that the amount bid is fair. So with that, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, bid for Historic Preservation of Western Connecticut uh, at $45,000 with all the caveats of cleaning up the right side of the driveway as part of that. Thank you. Is there a second to that for discussion, I guess, at this point? Second. Selectman Blake. Okay, can I ask, and I don't know, maybe maybe you guys probably can't answer it, what are they going to do for $45,000? I think we ought to know that. This is the back wall of the house. The uh, west side. The west side, west side. bulge. Foundation. So towards the brook. Toward the brook. Okay. The house was so significantly uh, added to with guide wires and restoration to keep it solid that the foundation on the west side moved. It was straight at one time, but so much had to be done to straighten the house that that wall that was straight then bulged. And it's out significantly enough that it needs to be straightened. And there's going to be, of course, Ed can help, but there's going to be a trench dug and a wall put in on the other side and then the, on the other side, on the outside, and then the stones will be replaced, dry laid as they are now, which is the cost. If you just plug in cement, you could push it, plug in the cement, and you'd have a done deal. But because everything is historically correct at the Bryan House, it's got to be taken down, pushed out, and put back up again. And we found so they're going to pour a wall on the outside of the wall. Is that what she's saying? Reinforce concrete. So they're going to take down the stone wall on the inside and then rebuild it. Either that or push well, it. I think he's no, pushing it. I uh, believe he's pushing it <coughs> flat. But Ed will tell you. I think I was in error on that. That's why you are who you are, and I'm who I am. <laughs> Uh, the, 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 plan, what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> the plan developed by the structural engineer calls for the found a uh, uh, concrete wall on the outside and to keep the, the bulging wall from moving as they straighten it up gradually from the inside. This will be like when you so jack up something in the basement, you do it an inch at a time or less. So they're not actually taking the st no. stone wall down? No, no. Okay. They're going to push the bulge outward. The bulge is, in, bulge is inside. Okay. And if, yeah, I've seen this happen before. Mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, and if the wall, the existing wall, should come tumbling down just by accident when that machine digs along there, sometimes by vibration or a little oops of the bucket, um, or just the movement of dirt, is there possibly more expense to it if the wall comes down altogether. Did anybody ask him that? Because that is a possibility with a dry laid wall. Yes, according to the structural engineer, if it's, the procedure is followed according to his plan, that won't happen. And that's why we hired a structural engineer, just so there'd be no, it would be, not saying you know, something won't go wrong, but we tried to reduce the possibility to a minimum. Because, I mean, it does happen sometimes. It could happen, and the answer there is it would have to be put back up piece by piece. All right, so then my question is, is there additional cost? And we don't know that answer. We don't know that answer. Okay, uh, and so then my question to go with that is, where is the money coming from, and do you have enough in reserves in case there is additional cost? <laughs> Somebody else is coming. <laughs> that falls out. Marlene and I know this answer. Yes, we have $74,000 left from the original DECD grant of 285, and this 45 falls in place with that. So hopefully, your scenario will not take place, so we have to use up the balance. Okay. You say the 74, the, the 45 is going to be part of the 74. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. It is. Yes, sir. Selectman Cousin Creel. Was there? 
the, the structural engineer Ed has just been brought in to deal with this foundation repair. At this point, us. yes, but he's been involved at, at, from the beginning in little things here and there. A lot of his time is donated because he's a local person. Because uh, did I understand that the renovations that have done been done up to this point are what caused the foundation to bulge? That I'm not aware of. I don't know what the cause is. Well, that's what they think. Well, that's what yeah. Ginny thinks. I, I, a lot of times what happens, I, I just, by happenstance, I looked at a 1740s house today. And, uh, Very nice house. Uh, no, actually, no. It's north, yeah. And um, a lot of those houses that are multi-hundred years old are crooked, uh, including my own house, which is 1860-ish. Uh, is crooked and what they did was they straight they straightened it and when straightening it it took pressure off the wall by taking pressure off gave the stone a little wiggle room and the kind of did this and anybody who lives in an old house can understand that what you're saying then is that uh, if you want to restore an old house to its original condition you should leave it crooked <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So, anyhow, so that's probably what happened here. When they pulled and straightened, it took the pressure off, which gave the wall just enough room just to loosen up. Yeah. <coughs> and it walked out. Okay. What I said about the wall and moving wasn't my statement, but between the state and the structural engineer, yeah. as Jim says, as things moved. Yeah. So... I'd like to speak to the selectman for a minute, if I may, on another issue that's related to the Bryan House. Well, why don't you let us let us finish oh, okay. this? Let us finish this one, and then we'll let you. Okay. Uh, is there any more discussion, Ralph? I just it's a question, I guess, for for Jenny and for Attorney Marino. As this bid has not been signed nor checked at the bottom, is this considered a legal bid? You want to field that one? <laughs> I, have, I haven't seen that paperwork. I haven't seen another. I would say it is a legal bid, Ed. This, uh, Ed, sorry, Ralph. Um, this man has provided. We have. I, I we have. We have bonding in place from him. We have a, a okay. escrow held by him. He's since he has started the work on this okay. house, so he's already passed all of those requirements that we need to hold. Uh, his insurance okay. and everything is all on file already. This has been going on for what three, three years now, okay. so that part of it he he fits all the requirements for. Okay. And, and he did write a letter which Ed has oh, he okay. received today, uh, giving us an outline of the time frame, pending your approval. So he okay. did uh, acknowledge that. I, I'm just a little weary wary because of uh, there were no other bids, and a bid comes in with just type information, no signature. I just want to make sure. We're we're clear on that. I do know he has a letter that he brought to Ed today. Okay. Just another question, Jim. Yes, right. Are the other three or four companies that were involved initially, are they restoration, renovation contractors? Um, there were four, picked four picked up the bids and three attended the oh, site visit. Okay. I just no. wonder. Only one professed has showed some restoration, but not on the same magnitude as the gentleman that's been doing the work. Yeah, this house probably, uh, and Ginny and I have gone round and round on this, and there's reasons why it wasn't, and there's probably reasons why it should have been, and we will disagree to doomsday that I think it should have been across the street but uh, and others here at this table do too but at this point it's got uh, 200 plus thousand dollars into it uh, on top of buying it and insuring it and everything else and it is what it is so is there any more discussion on this Hearing none, can I uh, have, I, we have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Very good, unanimous. Now you would like to talk to us while you're here on something else with the Bryan House. Well, actually, you just alluded to it. Oh. Um, there have you're going to move it. 
there have been many, oh, several, comments for the past, past four years about moving the Bryan House. And I have stood on my head historically to give reasons why it shouldn't be moved. And I thought that this was a good forum to explain to the selectmen and the public that historically the significance of the house is on 208 acres, which is the start of the town of Orange from 1700. So you establish the house there. And moving it to an area behind the Stone Otis house takes its significance away. That's number one. Number two, it has a dry laid foundation, which is original. It has four fireplaces that are original and not able to be replicated. And if you did replicate them, you don't have the historical significance. The chimney stack in the basement is four, uh, four feet space and then rectangle posts, which is considered a vaulted chimney stack, one of four in the state of Connecticut. So if those people in our town that have wanted it to be moved would realize that the historical significance of the house is all of what I've said, plus the fact that Brian's Farms was the, begin of the beginning of the town of Orange. We cannot, in all conscience, move it to Tyler City Road. Now, I did uh, spend some time this week measuring the footprint of the house, and it's 40 feet depth 36 wide. The space in the back of the, of the uh, Stone Otis house is 100 by four, uh, 50 feet. If we put the Bryan house on that piece of property, the front porch will be in the street. And I have had members of this community say it'll fit. And I just felt that I had to go out with my own time and say to the public, it will not fit. Physically, it will not fit, but historically, it will lose all of its significance, and it is the oldest house in the town of Orange. And we should not move it from its site. Now, to We're not that it. end, no, well, that's, I'm we trying to have the, I'm not, I want the rumors and the conversation to, to stop. Um, the Historic Preservation and Museum Division of the Commission on Culture and Tourism has said if any money, public money is used to move the house, the project of moving the house has to go before the State Historic Preservation Office for approval. If any state or federal funds are used to move the house, the project of moving the house has to go before the State Historic Preservation Office for approval. And the project of moving the house will be reviewed by the State Historic Preservation Office for any adverse impact to the cultural integrity of the house, one criteria being its historic setting at 131 Old Tavern Road. That's very good information for something that we don't intend to do. <laughs> no, you folks don't, but it has been mentioned numerous times, and it's, it was needed to be said. And I thank you for your time and listening to me. Besides, I spent two hours measuring the house and the property. <laughs> what took you so long? Oh, honey, I work. I'm old. I work slowly. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, item number three. Uh, it's bid for police vehicles. Assistant Chief uh, Ed Cother is with us tonight. Just, just let me start by saying I'm not uh, looking for money outside of what's already budgeted for our vehicles, and I'm not looking for a whole new fleet either. Uh, we, we, do, uh, we do need to replace one more vehicle. We're looking for another unmarked vehicle uh, to add to the administrative vehicles. We typically get um, Crown Victorias in the past some SUVs for uh, patrol vehicles. What we're looking for this time is a, uh, a Taurus, a Ford Taurus, which is formerly known as a 500 from a few, a few years ago. Um, what we're looking, what we're asking for is, we got two quotes, one from the state contract price from Wagner Ford in Simsbury, which was $23,768. And a second quote from Crowley, which is $23,664. It's cheaper than a state contract, and that's, um, we're, we've been working with Crowley for several years. We're comfortable with them. They're responsive to, uh, to our needs. And uh, because it's lower than the state, uh, state contract pricing, we're asking to go with them. I move that it be approved. How's that for two of us getting along? Once in a while, you two do. <laughs> Um, all right, so this is a tourist, and this um, will go into the unmarked units. 
Uh, we have a motion and a second from Nastri and Goldblatt. Is there any more discussion on this? Jim? Ralph. Uh, that is, the, uh, is the money in the budget? Yes, the money's already in the budget. We're, the only thing we're changing is to an all-wheel drive Ford okay. Taurus and to go with uh, a company who's a little bit lower than the state contract okay. pricing. This is the third vehicle, right? We Correct. bought two Crown Vicks. Correct. Okay, I was sure. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be riding in a Taurus anytime soon. All, all those in favor? Uh, opposed? Abstain? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, you're all set, Chief. Okay. Very good. Okay, met you down to one cl classmate here. I know who's getting the A in the course. <laughs> okay, item number four, Dogwood Road Drainage Project, Mr. Lieberman. This area has been subject to icing uh, because of a lack of a drainage system there, and uh, it's a very narrow road and very dangerous, so we have money on town road aid, and we went out to bid, and we got uh, two bids from local contractors, and TM Wright was the low bidder. Uh, we're going to provide the, uh, the pipe and the catch basins, and we'd like to uh, have Mr. Wright's company uh, provide the, uh, the, the uh, equipment and the, and the uh, labor to put this drainage pipe in. It runs from uh, house number 455 to an existing catch basin at 443. Both are on the uh, east side of the road. One catch basin out of the four will be on the west side to pick up a drainage problem there. Can I ask, is this kind of uh, by Russell Avenue there? Is that where we're talking? No, it's more starts at Cricket, just just north of Cricket Lane. To, to the turn. Cricket Lane. Raven Avenue? No, no. No, Cricket. Cricket. Cricket, Cricket is, is on. Dog, well, that's Dogburn there. Okay. At Dogwood. 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 Oh, Cricket's on Dogwood. Burn. Cricket's on the other side. Cricket's on the other side of where Harlan Denny lives, Mrs. Harlow's house. Oh, that, it's it's 455. I think it's that one. Remember the one where they had to put the temporary hose out from the guys? Is there near Kennedy? Kennedy, I'm yes, sorry, Kennedy, Kennedy, uh, Kennedy, that's Kennedy. Right. Okay, towards Kennedy. Russell, Kennedy. but it doesn't go as far as Russell. Yeah, be, there's, a, there's a problem yeah, in there. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Russell, right. will, Russell will be used as a detour while this is. Okay, and on. you have money for this is coming out of your town aid ro town aid road grant. That's correct. And you're looking for a total in case they hit uh, ledge or anything. In right. case, imagine, <laughs> in orange, uh, eleven thousand two hundred dollars. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Any so questions on that motion? Well, we already got it over here. Uh, Nastri Cozacrio. Any more discussion on this one? Hearing none. That's for $11,200. It's going to be awarded to uh, TM Wright for the bid price of $9,695. We're putting in a contingency for uh, difficult digging. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Unanimous. Thank you.